Okay, hello. Uh, uh, welcome to Portsmouth this week. Today is the 7th of June, 2013. Uh, our guest today is Representative Jay Edwards from District 70, Portsmouth and Tiverton. And Jay is also the Senior Deputy Majority Leader of the House. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're really in the news these days, so we have a lot of kind of things to talk about. I know you've been keeping busy, and I know that the session is due to end sort of at the legislative session at the end of the month. So there's kind of a lot of work to be done right at the end here, it looks like. You've recently sponsored a couple of key bills. I, the most important one, I think, to most people probably is the one that was reported on nicely in the Newport Daily News yesterday, and that's the bill you sponsored in the House along with Senator De Palma from Middletown, who sponsored an, a similar bill in the Senate about stopping the toll on this kind of river bridge. And I, I, I'd like to kind of discuss that first. What are the key elements of your bill, and why do you think it has a shot of, you know, getting through? Well, it, it's a fairly involved bill. Um, what it does is it sets up a sustainable and predictable funding formula for the continued maintenance of our bridges. Um, and at the same time, it freezes the toll in place on the Pell Bridge, and it makes sure that we don't have a toll on the Sakana River Bridge because we're going to basically, be, the state is going to be funding this. It adds 19 bridges to the Turnpike and Bridge Authority, every bridge over 700 feet. Um, I'm sure that some of those bridges that are just like on-ramps and stuff will probably be given back to DOT because it would be probably problematic um, to incorporate them, but we'll see how, the, how that works when the bill is vetted. Um, and what it does is it increases the inspection fees. It also increases the fines for uninsured motorists, of which there are many in the state of Rhode Island. And it adds a surcharge, a, ta uh, a, an, um, a tax on people who have insurance. And that's going to be basically inversely reciprocal. You're going to have, we're going to be driving people who, have, who are not insured presently. We're going to be through heavier fines. We're going to be trying to get them to be insured. Okay. And we're going to have the people who are currently insured that, that amount. So they're going to be, hopefully they'll pass, and we'll have more people who are insured. So they'll be paying the 2% as opposed to fining people, and we'll be driving better behavior. Okay, now we, we pay that 2% now on our, on our car insurance? No, this would be an added. Okay, this would be an added. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't realize, number one, that there were that many big bridges in, in Rhode Island, but... Uh, uh, your, your, your funding me mechanism, and it was really detailed quite nicely, I thought, in the Newport Daily News article. Uh, also talks about some, D, some DMV funds. Uh, can you kind of walk us through that? Well, every year, I mean, the DMV generates through licensing, licensing and all kinds of fees, they generate revenue for the state. What we're going to do, is starting in fiscal year uh, 2015, is taking $5 million of that out of the general fund and putting it aside towards this bridge fund. So it'll be guaranteed. And the following year, we'll take $10 million. And the year after that, we'll take $15 million until we accrue up to a point where we're having $40 million a year coming out of the DMV fees. Rather than going to the black hole of the general fund, they'll be going directly to this maintenance fund for all these bridges. Okay. So we're going to be setting up, and it's a 10-year program. We're looking to, we have to make about $265 million just to maintain the four bridges. What this will do is it sets up a, a fund that over the 10 years will have approximately $466 million. So we're picking up the maintenance on the other bridges. Now the, the Providence Viaduct, that's going to be federally funded. They're going to be doing a tremendous amount of repair work. That will be, the maintenance for that will, will kick in after it's turned over, over to us again. Okay, so, so right now these DMV funds go directly into the general fund. Yes. And, are, and disappear somehow. Well, they, they get, they I understand. fund they, a lot they, of different sure, programs. Sure, absolutely. And what, what we're trying to do is focus these now, take these, the uh, income from those gradually over time to go into the bridge repair fund. Yes. And that seems to work. Uh, what I liked about it when I read about this approach was it seems like a very comprehensive approach as opposed to some of the other ones that I've seen that have kind of been a piece of this, a piece of that, you know, one at a time, let's just add taxes. Uh, I, I guess my, my question is, do you really think this has a shot? It just seems kind of late in the game to be doing this, but maybe 
this is the right time. How do you, what do you think? Well, sometimes a crisis, like putting a toll on the bridge, I mean, they, they put the gantries up, they're starting to do all the electrical, they're doing the little building. It's yeah, kind of starting to panic now. Yeah. Well, th sometimes a crisis actually will generate something that's worthwhile. And Senator Palmer, who is the principal architect of this, this bill, um, put a tremendous amount of work into it. On the House side, we, got, you know, we, we reviewed it and tweaked it, but he put a tremendous amount of effort into this, this legislation over a, um, a number of months. I mean, he introduced a bill that was similar to this that we picked up on the House, um, I believe, like in March. So this has been really well tweaked. Um, Senator Piva Weed said that the one good thing about putting the toll on, proposing the toll for this kind of a bridge is it forced us into this look, a, a really comprehensive look at our infrastructure so that something like this could come out of the General Assembly this year. And both Senator Palmer and I think we have a fair shot of getting something passed to keep the toll off the bridge. Yeah, I, I just, uh, it hasn't been obvious to me, and a lot of people I think in Portsmouth, that people will recognize the economic impact that a toll is going to have, not just on the island. It's also going to have an impact on people driving off the island to do business, and it's going to increase the cost of everything coming into here. And when you think about the only two toll bridges in the state are connecting, are two of the three mm -hmm. that connect us to the mainland. It seems like we're doing more than our fair share here. Uh, so, so you really think this, this, you're, you're, this bill has potentially for legs is going to... Well, Senator Palmer introduced his on Wednesday. I introduced mine on Wednesday. I have a hearing before our House Finance on Tuesday. That's pretty darn quick. Okay. And I hear the Senator's got either Wednesday or Thursday. So the leadership is taking really good notice of this. Um, and as I said, this bill has to be vetted. And one of the best ways to vet it is to have it as a, as a single piece of legislation and have it go before the committees and, and have all the committee members ask a lot of serious questions. Okay, so, so we'll be able to p potentially see some action on this thing in the next week or so. Then. If we don't see some action the next week, we're we, not going to we see hope. action this year. Yeah, that, that's kind of the problem. Uh, I, I, I'd like to encourage everybody to... Uh, take a look at the bill and, and all the, the different facets of it. I think it's a very comprehensive look at doing this thing that makes sense going forward. Nobody likes additional taxes. Nobody likes additional fees. The fact is that costs are in, uh, increasing and so they've got to be paid somewhere. Uh, let me shift gears a little bit because, uh, as you know, Portsmouth has taken a legal approach trying mm -hmm. to get the bridge toll stopped. Uh, do you think th th that has any possibility of succeeding or, or how do you view that along with your own legislation? Well, it's like anything else. If you want to stop the tolls, you have to put a lot of hooks in the water to catch the fish. Yeah. So I think the legal approach was really good. I was very, very pleased that Portsmouth, Tiverton, and Bristol have, are working on it. Um, I was pleased to see Tiverton join because, I mean, it really is a community effort. And all, all the, um, the, the towns in this area really need to be part of it. I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to to be one or don't play one at night. Um, <laughs> you don't play one on TV. <laughs> no, I don't play one on TV. But from what I under, understand, I, I think that Portsmouth has a shot. Um, I think this, the town solicitor has, has done a really good job putting it together, and um, I'm, I wish them the best because we need to take a multitude of approaches at this. I mean, not only from the General Assembly, but also from the local approach, and I think that was a really good tack they, they made. Yeah. Uh, I, I think people who want to take a look at your bill should either go to the uh, RI legislative website, which is great, and it's got a big, in fact, if you want to follow the, the progress of this bill, it's got a thing you can click on and sign up for to get updates mm -hmm. on, on your emails about what the status of these bills are. Uh, I'd also, again, in, encourage people to read the Newport Daily News and the other press, the Providence Journal. Uh, they have a pretty detailed article about this. Uh, yeah, I, getting back to Portsmouth's approach, I guess right now we're kind of waiting for the courts, the uh, district court, to decide if, Br if Bristol and Tiverton can join this suit. Mm -hmm. I'm, again, this is angels in the head of a pen for a civilian, but uh, I guess you can understand this if you're a lawyer. Uh, another bill that, that you've, you've been pretty busy here, particularly very recently, that uh, uh, looks promising, I think, is one called House Bill 5038. Anybody wants to go online again, they can look that up. Um, this will require parties or our political action committees uh, to report to the board of canvassers all contributions in excess of $100. Uh, 
And I guess the, the interesting thing is to me, why do you think this is needed now? And what is the current status of that bill? This bill became out because in Tiverton we have, uh, we have a, a town charter and we used to have town meeting. And we had a charter change that was voted on. And there was a group that organized and they put forth their, their voice on what side of the charter change they really wanted. So and we, and they spent a lot of money. They spent it all over the place in town. And they took in a lot of money. And we, so at the end of the election, the, the, the thing went through, and I wanted to see what, you know, where they received their money from yeah. and who they spent it on. And they didn't have to report it. So I called the Board of Canvassers, and, and um, the gentleman told me, oh, no, that's correct. They don't have to report it. So I said, this is just completely ludicrous. I have to report all my campaign contributions. I have to report where I spend my money. So these people should also. So I put legislation in last year, which passed, that would make them um, have to report where they receive the money from. And when, because it was late in the year, yeah. we weren't able to correct it. We missed putting in where they, where they spent it. So this year, we, we're just filling that little hole. So it's not just contributions, it's also what it was used for. Yes. Yeah. And it's interesting that th this thing came out of a local problem that, that you saw in Tiverton. It, it basically would, would include the entire state. I guess, you know, the, the, the trend should be now more and more openness. I think mm -hmm. most people started to realize that. Tools like the Internet are great tools for this. And uh, I guess my question is, if people report to the Board of Canvassers, this would be, for example, in Portsmouth, they would report to the Lo Portsmouth Board of Canvassers, or is no, this the state board? They would report to the state board. Okay. And, and it's all filed online. And it's um, available to the public. Yeah, and anyone, any person yeah. can go, and they, if they know the name of the group, they can go on and say, you know, um, Brownies did, and you can see what the Brownies took in and what the Brownies spent their money on. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a great bill. And uh, you think it's, uh, what is the status of that now? Do you know? It's yeah. already passed the House, um, okay. and it's gone before Senate Judiciary, so. It's okay. sitting over there. Now, again, what is the process? So it goes to the House, it goes to the Senate. What actually happens is you introduce a piece of legislation, it goes, it gets assigned to a committee, the committee that will then vet it. And then there's this process where they, everyone says, well, they have this, it's held for further study. Everyone thinks that's the end of a bill. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> and most people feel that way. But actually what happens is the committee holds the bill and they review it. They go through any bill, even if it's a very good piece of legislation that's needed, they'll go through and they check it for punctuation to make sure it's in the right, right part of the law. They make sure the bill is correct. Um, I've had some legislation which I had drafted and I thought it was, a, you know, it looked excellent to me, but again, not being a lawyer, I submitted the legislation and they found, you know, grammatical mistakes in it, they found errors, they found the wrong place in the law. So that's why they hold bills for further study. Okay. So what happens, it gets voted out of committee, it goes to whatever particular chamber that is, then it gets voted out of that chamber and goes across the hall to the other chamber and then it gets assigned to the committee over there. Okay. They vet it again and then it gets voted to the, their floor. After it's passed both houses, it goes to the governor. Okay. So it's kind of like sausage, we really don't want to know how it's made, right? Because <laughs> it sounds very complicated, but... Uh, uh, I can understand. So, so it's really reviewed many times in this process, which is, I guess, is the purpose of there's a lot of checks uh, and balances. You you also sponsored sponsored a bill called uh, House Bill 5103, and this was specific specifically designed. It looks like to give protection to people who are renting, uh, say, an apartment, and the owner defaults on his mortgage, mm -hmm. and and the house is or, or the the property is in foreclosure, and it protects those tenants from having to move out if the bank decides they want to do something else with it. What prompted this bill? Was this another kind of local issue that? Actually, it was. I, I live on, in Tiverton, and I had a house two doors up from me. I mean, when I was, I had been elected, and I was waiting to be sworn in in that little period there. And that they, the house was foreclosed on, and there were renters in there. And I remember I talked to the gentleman who owned, you know, he had a couple of young daughters. And I said, uh, what's going on? And he said, well, I, you know, I called the bank. I want, to pay the, I want to pay them the rent. I really want to stay here. And he said the bank absolutely refused. They said you would have X amount of days to move out, and that's it. So I said, this is completely wrong. There's got to be some recourse here. And I found that there wasn't. So I introduced legislation uh, my freshman term. Yeah. Um, it was promptly crushed a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> um, but last term, 
I reintroduced the bill, had it cleaned up, and it passed the House both times. So it's right now it's, it is being held by both committees. I think there's some negotiations going on between the House and Senate as to language that's in, in the, on the bill. But uh, I'm hopeful that something will come out this year. Okay, great. I, 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 it's not the tenant's fault that the, no. the owner defaults, you know. And it, it might be a, a, you know, a, a pretty rare occurrence in Tivin or Portsmouth, but this was a pretty normal occurrence during the, the whole housing crisis up yeah, in Providence absolutely. and Pawtucket. I mean, a lot of people were evicted out of their homes. They had a lot of empty neighborhoods up there. So I look at this as a win-win. I mean, the banks get income yeah. when, they're, when, when they're holding the property. The tenants get to stay in the property. And the town doesn't, you know, they continue to get their taxes. And they have a property that doesn't get vandalized. I mean, there's people in there. Somebody in there, sure. Yeah, and watching the house. Yeah, a lot of good reasons to do that. So, uh, well, good luck. I hope we'll keep an eye on that one, too. Uh, I, I noticed when, when I signed up, up to the bill tracker system that they have, that both that, that bill, 5103, and, and another one called 5207, and I thought this was interesting. This, is, this would create a joint committee of the repealer. And I was trying to think, what the heck does that mean? And it, it, the point of this committee would be to compile suggestions for the repeal of statutes, old statutes, regulations, I guess, and executive orders that basically don't apply anymore and get rid of some of this stuff. Uh, both, both of those bills have been held for further study, and you kind of indicated that mm -hmm. that doesn't mean a dead end. Uh, is that the same kind of with this uh, repealer bill? Is that, you think that's still po got possibilities? It's just that they're going through more detailed study. Um, actually, I think they're, they're reviewing it right now because I'm not sure how they're going to handle it. It passed the Senate. I got to went out and got a Senate sponsor. This is a bill I picked up from Kansas. The, uh, the governor of Kansas instituted as a, an executive order, and they set up an uh, office of the repealer. Well, I said, well, you know, the governor here has got his hands full. He's got a lot of things going on. We should set up a joint committee because we're actually the ones who do most of the legislation. We'll have senators and reps get together off-season, review all these bills, receive input, you know, and find out legislation that's unconstitutional, doesn't fit with our business climate, um, and people really want to have repeal. This will give the people an opportunity to contact right, this Public com comments and... And public input. And if you say, I, everyone around us says, well, you know, no one ever listens to us. This is a perfect opportunity for our legislature to get direct input from the citizens and actually act on it. And they would come back in January before the full House and Senate and present these bills that need to be repealed and have both houses review them and repeal them. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. And you want, again, you wonder why, why hasn't this been done before? Because we all know that the, there, there are a lot of these things in, on the books that don't even relate to current reality. And uh, yeah. this at least gives you an opportunity to get rid of them. Well, good luck with that one, too. Well, one example of that is there's an old bill that says if, you pass on the, if you're going to pass a car on the left, you have to honk your horn as you're pulling out and then honk your horn as you're pulling back in. <laughs> I'm sure so, everybody does that, right? <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen anyone do that in Rhode Island yeah. in a long time. Well, in Rhode Island, we pass on the right anyway. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, one apparent success for our town, uh, and recently at least, was the bill authorizing the formation of a municipal court in Portsmouth. And again, that seemed to go through all the wickets and everything and was approved. So basically, what is the status of that in terms of, I guess, the law? I mean, are we now authorized? Is the town of Portsmouth um, I'm not sure where the status is with the governor. The governor has to sign the off on it. The governor has to sign off on it? Be, be, or he has to let it sit for 10 days and not with no action. And a okay. lot of times that's what happens with these bills. Yeah. Well, I could see because I, I think uh, town administrator John Clem made some good points about how we could use that mm -hmm. municipal court here in Portsmouth. I was surprised you didn't have one because we have one in, in Tiverton. Yeah. yeah. I think it, uh, it, it makes us fall back on the Newport courts, and it's just very awkward and difficult to get anything done here, I think. Also, the town has a little more insight, especially if it's, their residents are coming before it. They have a little more insight. Yeah, and I think so, Lo for, for local things. Mm -hmm. You know, w one of your jobs, you're the senior deputy majority leader of the House, and congratulations on that, I guess. Uh, I, I'm not exactly clear on, on what all your duties are, but the thing is, it would seem to, to the layperson that what this does is gives you pretty good access to the leaders, to Speaker Fox and to the other leaders of the legislature. How has this helped, or do you think this helps you uh, do things for your constituents in Portsmouth and Tiverton? Well, it doesn't give us complete and total access, but what it does is we have probably more access. Um, and we actually have an opportunity to discuss our issues, especially stuff coming out of district. 
I'm sure the speaker is probably sick to death of hearing <laughs> from me about the tolls. Yeah. We have leadership meetings every week, yeah. and I make sure at some point in the meeting I get the toll in there to the point where some of the other members say, you know, oh, it's the tolls again. But the speaker is very, very aware of it. And I, I think what it does for my constituents is it gives me access beyond the leadership. Um, when I have a constituent issue, I can call and talk to the, di the director of that particular department on their behalf. And I get a little bit quicker access. So and in that respect, it's been helpful. Now, now how did you, how did you uh, sort of rise up to that position? Is it something that you uh, apply for? Or? No, this, you're chosen by the speaker. Okay. It's completely at his discretion. Okay. So they must like you up there in the well, senior quarter of power. I, I work hard, <laughs> and the speaker knows I work extremely hard for my district. So. Well, that's great. And I have a, a little more of a moderate bent than some of the members up there. So yeah. he, he likes to have a full spectrum of people. Okay, great. Well, keep up the good work then, because we need it up there. Uh, and speaking of local constituents, what... What is what is your method of, of communicating with folks and, and to meeting with people and talking with people and getting the pulse of what concerns uh, people in Tiverton and Portsmouth? Well, How obviously, do you do that? as a legislator, I mean, I receive a lot of email, um, and people will be surprised that I don't re really send email back. I find that your email going back can be altered. So I always respond to people in a letter form. Um, I have my cell phone number on in the message uh, at my house. I have it, my cell phone on my business card. So I have a lot of people call me directly. And I think most of the time they're, they're surprised. They say, hi, can we talk to the representative? Well, you're talking, you're talking to, to them. them yeah. You know, I, we don't have staff. <laughs> you know, you, you call the phone, you yeah. get me directly. So I am very, very available. Now, do you have any kind of periodic meeting or anything with the town mm -hmm. officials in, in both towns? No, um, we did before. We used to come in a couple times during the year. Um, but I mean, both towns have been very, very busy, as, as have we. And so, you know, we, we have gone to Portsmouth a couple times. I've gone and met with um, the president, I mean, the, the president, Jim Seveny, and a couple of members to discuss issues that, you know, directly affect them, mostly sure. environmental issues. Um, I've gone in a couple of times, and I speak with both um, presidents on a, on a regular basis. Okay, so you, you have ways you can contact each other if you need to talk. Oh, yeah. I and some of the that. members actually had me on speed dial. So. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, I, I think I would if I was in the town council. Absolutely. Uh, so the best best way for somebody to reach you would be by email, perhaps, or by telephone. Or, yeah, call my cell phone. Okay, great. Uh, we'll have to get your cell phone. You want to tell people what your cell phone number is? Sure. It's 401-662-6280. Okay, thanks. And you will get me directly. All right. <laughs> that, that's great. Uh, as you, as you know, because I know you came to our, our, one of our first events on the 7th of March, the uh, founding of the compact ceremony we had, which was really cool, I thought, because we actually had, as you know, the 1638 real compact mm -hmm. that was actually really written in 1638 on display. Uh, but we're celebrating our 375th anniversary this year. And... Uh, I'd like to ask, when you go back up to Providence, can you try to generate some support or at least recognition from some of our state leaders up there and in the fact that, we, yes, Providence was founded before us, but we're right after that, and we're very proud of the fact that we're 375 years old. And we'd like to get some, you know, at least some acknowledgement out of the senior leadership up there. And we'd love to have some of these people come down to some of our events, perhaps. Well, I will do everything I can to bring the Speaker of the House down when we have the event in, uh, in September. Okay. And I'm sure I'll, I will get some other members. Um, I'm sure the governor will probably come down, as he should. At one time, like people don't know there. this, Portsmouth actually had as many representatives in their house as did Providence. And it was actually written into law that they each had four. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. Those were back in the days, you know. But uh, I, I know... Uh, the, the, the real problem came after the, revolution, after the Revolutionary War when, when we were occupied by the British for two years on the mm -hmm. island here. And from that time on, it was hard for Newport to get back into the political swing of things. But uh, the, speaking of this thing, we, we have a big cluster of events. We have events going on all year long, and we've got a couple coming up. One is the uh, uh, Portuguese American Club Clam Boil. It's going to be in the 23rd. Hopefully you can come to that. It's mm -hmm. always a an annual thing, uh, uh, event, we're, we're partnering with the, the Portuguese American Club and the 375th Committee 
try to make this a kind of special one. That's on the 23rd, and people need to sign up probably for that uh, pretty early. Uh, but we're also on the, we have this weekend cluster of events. It's around Labor Day, and I know that's, those holidays are, are important times for people like you that have a lot of other uh, obligations. But it actually starts on Thursday, and we're inviting the Lord Mayor of Portsmouth, England, our, our mm -hmm. namesake uh, city. And uh, we recently got back from a trip there where they treated us like rock stars. It was, it was really great. But the Lord Mayor and the, Lord, and the Lady Maris, who is a friend of the Lord Mayor, uh, she's a, a lovely lady named Lynn Stagg. They're coming and we're having a reception at Glen Manor House, kind of a classy mm -hmm. reception there on Thursday night. And uh, this is going to be a, a kind of a major fundraiser for the 375th, but it's going to be a real gala event. And I would hope that perhaps we could get some guys like you coming down from Providence to show the flag or something, and maybe the governor to come down, and Speaker Fox perhaps, to come down and, and join us and mingle and, uh, and meet our guests from abroad. We're also having the mayor of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and his wife, and the mayor of Portsmouth, Virginia, and, and his wife. So it's, uh, those are kind of our key guests for just for that weekend period. And then there's, uh, there are other things. There's a parade on Saturday. Uh, we, we'd love to have you come down and march in the parade on Saturday. I'm sure you're going to come You know, you can never miss us on a parade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know those things are, are, are fun to do. Uh, but there are a lot of opportunities. And as I say, one of the purposes of this whole 375th thing is to try to bring the community together. You know, I mean, you're in Tiverton, and you know how politically rancorous it can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, Portsmouth has been the same way. And I'd like to think that this is something that everybody in town, regardless of what they think politically of everybody else, can get together on. You know, uh, I'm sure you do the same thing I do when you drive over that bridge that's going to be told unless we can fix it. But when you drive into Portsmouth, you say, what a beautiful area. It's just such a beautiful area. And I think the point of this is to try to get everybody to appreciate that. Uh, one of the things we're doing on the 4th of July, are you in the Bristol parade usually in the 4th no, of July? No, if you don't represent Bristol, you don't get to march. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, Louis Escobar is going to be doing his fireworks. We're trying to help him augment that a bit, uh, and, and it's just going to be a it, it's going to be a fun time for Portsmouth, I think. And we're we're starting to get into the swing of things. It's taken us six months out of this year. Wow! To actually get people to even recognize that the, the 375th. What is that? Uh, and they'll be seeing more of this stuff. We actually have things like frisbees, as you can see behind yeah. us. Guaranteed to be the fastest, best, easily, <laughs> easily thrown Frisbee in the world. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, marketing some of this stuff to try to raise money for other, other uh, events. Uh, we, we only had a couple minutes here, but I just wondered if you'd like to leave any kind of final message, not final, but a message to your constituents here well, you, about you, what you're you, doing going forward. You, you talked about how the, you know, the towns are divided. I found that the, the toll issue has really brought people of every spectrum together. I mean, every class, every spectrum together in both communities. So the people need to keep going at it. They need to keep uh, reminding the House and, and Senate leaderships that this is going to be detrimental to our area and that uh, your reps and senators are working as hard as we can to keep this off. Okay. Uh, what is the best thing we can do, we residents could do to kind of, I mean, can we flood somebody with letters, emails, or I'd does say that e help? I'd say emailing the speaker, Speaker Fox, and emailing uh, Chairman Helio Mello. Um, and telling them that you support House Bill 6210. 6210. Um, which is the House version, and I think it's 989, the Senate side. Okay. And that's your new bill? That's the new bill okay, that, that sets up this whole big bridge program. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks very much, Jay, for coming on board today, and uh, I really wish you luck with this thing. We're, we're pushing for you. Thank you. So thank you very much. And thank you. We'll see you next time.